Welcome to the great conversation where ideas matter. Ideas can shape markets and ideas can change the world. I am fascinated with our, as you all know, with our personal, professional, and corporate, that is, community path to value. Um, it's not easy. There's so many factors that are at play and at stake in constructing a valuable life, a valuable business, a valuable community. And value is not elusive. We all know what it feels like. It's not just money. It's not status. It's not just power. It's this idea of have we been able to create something that we're proud of, something that's lasting, something that has touched other people in, in wonderful ways. So I'm attracted to people who are in the midst of that walk, that path to value. One of the one of the things that I've seen many CEOs, since I coach a lot of CEOs and I advise a lot of CEOs, seen them do is um, have check marks for various regulatory and compliance things. Very useful. Check marks are useful. Tasks are useful. But I always make them pause before I have them check it off. And pause, say, is there something more going on here than simply a check mark? Is there something going on here that would make you more strategic, more competitive, and more valuable? And one of one of the things I'm tracking is this um, this thing called DEI, or diversity, equity, and inclusion. And I've been reading a lot of thought leaders on the subject, and people touch on it in different ways, by the way. There's uh, organizational consultants. Um, there's consultants who are interested in change management. Uh, there's uh, people who are looking at it from a, just a social equity standpoint and also others that are leveraging it from a human capital standpoint. And the other day, uh, in my pursuit of ideas, I ran across Dr. Jade Singleton, and I asked her to be on this podcast, and I just can't wait to have a, a great conversation with Jade. Jade, welcome. I'm so, so thrilled to be here. Thank you so much for having me. It is an absolute honor. And, and those of you listening, you'll see why in a second. So Jade, ha let's have some fun first. Okay. And because it's unbelievable the historical context by which you're even here. Tell, <laughs> tell, tell everyone your, your historical roots here, your ancestral roots. It's just amazing. Yeah, yeah. So, um, I, yeah, so, I, I, you know, I think we're talking a little bit about Sarah Jane Academy, which is is my um, my program here for um, for DEI practitioners um, being named Sarah Jane. So my aunt was actually the first black woman uh, in the United States to be a professor. Her name was uh, Sarah Jane Woodson. Um, and, you know, the family has a long history of pushing equity and inclusion um, over the years and years. And um, we come from a Jefferson Hemings background, uh, for, for those of you uh, that are aware. And so these kind of difficult conversations, right, that come up in DEI are really a part of our, our fabric uh, ever since I can remember. Well, uh, uh you know, you slid over that pretty quick and people don't <laughs> necessarily grasp that. Tell us Jefferson Hemming connection. What, what, who is that? What are you talking yeah. about? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So, um, so uh, Je for, for those who don't know, so Jefferson had a, um, a, we're talking Thomas Jefferson, Thomas Jefferson one President. of the founders <laughs> of our country. Keep yeah. going. Yes, yes. He um, he had an enslaved um, woman by the name of uh, of Sally Hemings, with whom he had uh, multiple children um, by. 
Uh, and so, you know, these these children went off into the world and, and uh, did a multitude of, of, uh, of different things. And my, um, you know, direct line really focused on um, education a lot. So there was a lot of history around uh, they made their mark in Ohio um, and set up a, you know, a kind of homestead in uh, an area called Bailey's Crossroads uh, and really focused on, you know, making sure that, uh, that Black people had access. Uh, it's really interesting. Some of them were operators on the Underground Railroad. Um, so I had two uncles that were operators on the Underground Railroad and were killed actually for what they were doing as far as aiding and abetting uh, and, and helping slaves to be able to get to freedom. Um, and those actually would have been <laughs> Sarah Jean's brothers. Uh, and so it was a long, long um, history, just year over year. And then, of course, moving into like the civil rights movement and so on and so forth. So this struggle um, for equity and also being um, this kind of hybrid of, of what it is to be a, an, an American, right? The, the, it, it's very, very interesting because I'm kind of a um, you know, this, this interesting, um, hybrid, this interesting, uh, dichotomy of this love, uh, of America. And it's, it's, you know, the, the, the business pursuit and the, the entrepreneurship, et cetera. And then also having to kind of balance and battle, uh, in equity at this, at the very same time, you know, and it's, and I always say that's interesting because it doesn't get more American than me, you know, and a lot of times when we talk about DEI, uh, folks will say, well, you know, this seems a little anti-American. It seems like it's, you know, very social focused and it's not. And uh, and I always kind of bristle at that because I'm like, I am literally, you're literally looking at somebody that is from the soil and the fabric of the country. Uh, and DEI really doesn't have anything to, to kind of do with that. So I think there's a lot of kind of misunderstanding um, just because we're all embroiled, just like I am, kind of in this 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 kind of intricate dance that that lives in this gray nebulous area, uh, that makes it difficult for us to to talk to each other and talk straight. Wow! First of all, I love your language. It's so evocative. Uh, Thank you. <laughs> soil and the fabric, and I and I feel it in you, and I and of course I can see you right now too. But I feel it in you, and. Um, what other what what the audience should also understand though is also your individual pursuit in your career. Yeah. You touched on the very fabric of capitalization in America at many different levels. Go into that background a little bit before we get into some of the DEI ideas. Sure, absolutely. So, um, so I came out of uh, the banking industry, um, investment banking more specifically. Uh, worked at Freddie Mac and and Fannie Mae and Global Finance in uh, at uh, Capital One Bank. Uh, so that's really where I grew up. Right, was within uh, the banking system, but really focusing more on the human side of banking. So, I worked in asset management, which was really a lot of service or relationship um, management, which was very interesting, very cool to do. Uh, and then I also spent a lot of time, though, focusing on strategic transformation. So, adaptation, uh, digital evolution. How are we going to get folks to kind of move along? You know, the investment banking can 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 feel a bit legacied in, in a lot of ways. And so, how we're introducing this new fintech and keeping um, you know ourselves competitive? Um, how do we bring the people uh, along with this? Um, because if we don't have the people, then we're definitely going to fail. So, a lot of this was was very uh, culturally embedded of the work that I was doing. So that's what's fascinating to me because you're not only dealing with transformation in the digital space, transformation in the equity space. Not I'm not talking diversity equity right now. Yeah, in the sure. equity space as far as monetization of the yes. value of properties in the marketplace, the yes. human capital that would realize that value. You were mm -hmm. working in that entire sphere. So you have an in, intuitive and a practical sense of how business operates in this country. Yes, yes. I love it. Uh, you know, I like the energy uh, that you, you feel when you're talking to someone on a capital markets floor and, and things like that. And that's really where I was able to kind of cut my teeth and, and become who I am as a professional. Right. So now, given this unique, again, 
your, your roots go back to the soil and fabric of the nation. This idea of individual freedom, this idea of the American dream. The, yes. the, you know, the, so, so at, within the context of the great experiment, too, because it was an experiment. The yes. beginning of this country was an experiment. Up until then, we, the people, were captured under caste systems in Europe, mm -hmm. right? If you think about it, political, mm -hmm. religious, we didn't have the ability to necessarily break out of the molds that we in, had inherited through our, through our genes and our, yes. right? So, so it wasn't this idea was a great experiment. C can we give that degree of freedom to a population and have it be able to govern itself? So this, mm -hmm. this, this raw tension you grew up as from, from the standpoint of being black was not that very tension was built into the American experiment, that very tension, if you think about it. Absolutely. Yeah, it definitely uh, existed. And it's just been at our at our core from, you know, the inception of the right. of the country. Yeah. So lot, let's now talk about this, this company of yours, um, which is a consulting company and what resulted out of it, which is the Sarah Jane Academy, because yeah. I'm kind of interested when you're walking into a company today as an advisor, trainer, activator, and so forth, do you believe that most owners of businesses, executives of businesses are seeing this as strategic or as a check mark? I think I think that it depends. I've I've seen CEOs that were very, very focused on on this work and had been for a long time and, and didn't have the support that they ultimately needed. And then I've seen others where, yeah, it is a bit of that kind of check the box, for instance, uh, you know, hey, we've got investors that are coming in and they're looking to see if we have any of this stuff embedded and we need to get it in there. I think regardless of the the kind of um, the intent or how they feel about it, my job is to really help them understand how the world is, is ultimately shifting uh, what they're missing by having an inequitable system, the markets that they may be missing. So coming in with some really clear and clean uh, case study that speaks their that you know speaks their language, um, and not trying to uh, you know uh, force an ideology. And I and I think that's where a lot of practitioners can go wrong. I'm not trying to force an ideology. Um, upon anyone. I want them to be able to see this is the way forward. This is how society is moving. Uh, and we're finally getting to a place of some sort of balance, some sort of equity. And you want to be a part of that. Well, you said there, you put so much meaning into that last response. Um, and I so much appreciate it as someone who had has my own consulting company and my own advisory, I am very, very intent on listening first. Mm -hmm. Who is this person I'm going to be advising or persons? Mm -hmm. What context are they living in? And how can I help them take the next right step in their conscious and unconscious? Yeah path to value. So I really appreciate that. And I, I do agree with, with you. If you can, as a consultant, without an ideological war to fight, help them take the next right steps, you've done a, a massive job. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's interesting. Take me through, if I brought you in today, take sure. me through the process that would help me achieve that kind of strategic impact on my company. Absolutely. So the first thing that you would want to do, or I would want to do coming in as a consultant is do a diagnosis. And so um, the first thing that I'm going to be looking at is I want to know where your cohort demographics exist within your organization. For instance, I want to know not just kind of where your majority Black population sit within the organization. I want to know the Black female 
um, where a black female lesbian sits within your organization. I mean, I want to drill down into intersections. And the reason why I want to do that is because I want to see how these different demographics uh, have or don't have access to decision making. Um, and I want to see kind of if there's anything that might be clogging your pipeline, your internal mobility pipeline. And I'm going to pause there and just explain a little bit about why that would be the first thing that I would want to look at. The reason why that's the first thing I want to look at is because for all the wonderful business cases that we all know about, you know, the more diverse your team is, the better your bottom line, et cetera, et cetera. That only matters if the team is diverse that is making the decisions. So your managerial level, you're not going to see any ROI if you're just diversifying at the lower levels, right? So the first thing that I need to do is kind of take a look and diagnose where are your folks? I want to see who's coming in, who's, and I want to see who may be stuck. And then I want to have a conversation about that. I also want to look at pay. I want to see what folks are being paid. I want to see who's being promoted uh, as well. And what are those processes? Uh, how do they look? And then who has access to some of the internal mobility that, um, that exists within the organization? So for instance, I want to know, um, you know, let's say the most coveted skill set in your company is the problem solving. You, you know, you, people who can solve a problem get the biggest reward at your at your company. Fantastic. Does everyone have access to problem solving specific training like A3 thinking, et cetera? Or are there people that are being kind of left out for whatever reason that aren't getting the informal tap on the shoulder to, you know, opportunity? And how can we bridge those gaps? So that would ultimately be the first thing that I would do and where I would be able to help uh, the most kind of right away. Uh and that's interesting when you do the assessment there, um, nature versus nurture. Some people have these things innately, yes. and therefore, when they go through training, they accelerate through pretty quickly and adapt and are agile. How do you help them with the nature versus nature thing in the uh, nature versus nurture thing in the training, or even before that, if we want to get to root cause, how they identify and hire those people from the very beginning? Yeah. So so one of the things is that they have to get honest about what the culture actually is, not the boilerplate, um, you know, terms that they have kind of underneath their logo. I want to know what your actual culture is so that I can have, you know, provide some really informed um, consulting. And so I, you know, once we're able to kind of excavate that and go through that, we're able to better identify uh, whether there's any biases uh, that might exist there. So let's say you have a, a culture where it's, you know, hey, we're, we, we like to hire hard charging, uh, you know, bull in China shop, get, uh, get it done type of individuals. Well, that's fantastic. But if someone from a different background, let's say, can a black man that's six foot four have that same type of continence? Seriously, like, is he able to also kind of bang on the table and get? So it's 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 about understanding what's beneath the surface and how it applies to each of these different cohort demographics. That's the that's that's the gray area where a lot of folks miss. Um, can I actually? exercise what's going to get me uh, to the next level within the organization or accepted and adopted within the organization? Or do I have to learn a whole different pantomime uh, based on my identity? That is so profound. And uh, actually, it was featured on one of your blog posts or your, <laughs> one of your LinkedIn posts, right? And that is, if you have this culture of go get them, hard charging, speak the truth at all times, and and that's great, but if a six four black man does that, is it accepted the same way as a white man? Right. Exactly. And yeah. and, and, and and that that whole idea of context uh, is so profound, and it's absolutely true. Whether it's a woman, a yes. woman of color, a, a sure. man, a man of color, you know, it, a, a different background, it it's so true. It's more than just the behavior. Exactly. Yeah. And so you see folks, there's some something called uh, attributional ambiguity. 
and you're trying to figure out um, if you're a person from a, that has a marginalized identity or multiple marginalized identities, you're constantly trying to figure out like, what's the right combination for me? What is it that I need to be doing or how, what's the behavior for me? I hear what they're saying, but what's the actual behavior that I need to exhibit kind of given my identity to be able to survive and, and thrive within an organization? And that can be incredibly difficult to excavate because we we don't have, um, you know, executive coaches that are very well trained and how, you know, these these things are very nuanced, very, very nuanced. Um, and so you miss out on some of that leadership development that's actually going to work for you. So you're kind of left out there trying to figure it out on your own. Yeah, I thought a lot about this when I was growing up as a kid. Uh, one of my favorite teams was the Dodgers, and I was a history buff on baseball. And the uh, and the story of Branch Ritchie, uh, Ricky, and uh, and uh, and Jackie Robinson. You know the whole idea that I'm going to bring you into a place that most people would fail. Yeah. And and Branch Ricky saying, and the only way you have a chance of success is not to play into their ideas of who you are. Right. And, and, and he asked, and he asked them to be quiet at first, to navigate the halls. And I was thinking about that in today's DEI environment. When you go to a coach, you coach the organization. You not only have to coach the executives, you have to coach how these people are advised coming in all from rich cultural and demographic backgrounds, mm -hmm. how they navigate the halls of power as the culture adapts and begins to change itself. You, you have to teach both ends of the spectrum. Right, right, absolutely. And you know what we're finding and, and the research is consistently evolving. What we've learned a lot of is, is kind of cultural competence-based models where you know, the culture, it has these kind of, um, you know, everlasting truths about it, right? But what we're, we're finding is that was the absolute wrong way to go about so much of our training and how we think um, and how we should be inclusive, right? So cultural humility, cultural pluralism, understanding, you know, these things are fluid. These things change. They shift. They adopt. How do you equip someone uh, to show up in a space where they can actually be allies and, and, and advocates um, for someone who might be from, you know, an underrepresented uh, group versus, you know, just kind of this theoretical nicety uh, type of thing that we've had for years with kind of a cultural competency based um, based model. Yeah. Uh, we're not going to have time to go through your whole process, but let me touch on something you did say. You suggested that if you did get this right, if you got on that path to value where you started thinking of DEI as not a checklist, but actually of strategic value to the organization, if you can get them on that journey, what are, uh, what are, what are, what are the findings we have on that today? Bring that home for a second, that strategic value, Be, yeah. not just the human value. Sure. I, I get that one, but what's the strategic yep. value to the company? Absolutely. So um, Google did a really a profound study called Project Aristotle. Um, some of your listeners may be very familiar with it already, but basically what they found, they tested about 200 teams and they wanted to see, they mixed and mashed them all together. So people that had really cool skills, people who, who were you know more tenured with people that weren't, I mean, they, they did the whole gamut. And what they found was that psychological safety, which is a key factor in uh, inclusion produced uh, teams with higher levels of psychological safety outperformed consistently. And so what I mean by psychological safety is that you have things like, um, you know, there's phases of it. You have your um, safety to belong. So your safety to feel a part of the group. You have safety to, um, to contribute to the team and you have safety to learn and then ultimately you have safety to challenge okay and that's where you're going to start to see things like um uh, uh, better speed to market 
You're going to have better uh, risk mitigation. Um, people are going to raise their hands more quickly and say, hey, I identify a risk here or I identify a better market here, et cetera. They're not going to be afraid to, to try things. Um, when you have higher levels of psychological safety, you're going to get to faster innovation. Um, and, you know, all things that businesses really do care about to keep themselves viable and keep themselves competitive. Uh, and when you're talking about a diverse um, population of folks, psychological safety is, is so very critical because, as I mentioned, with that attributional ambiguity, your folks that are from underrepresented populations, we are constantly scanning the environment to determine whether or not this is a safe environment in which to challenge, in which to belong to, in which to learn from, right? So to me, that's the, the biggest um, and best, um, you know, uh, ROI that you could you could have is being in an environment that's psychologically safe that's actually realizing true inclusion. And some of the uh, most outstanding advisors of business, you all know them from Drucker to Porter to Lencioni, five dysfunctions of a team, all touch on this psychological safety. Now we're getting more formalized and more direct and more strategic in how we implement them. And it's because of advisors uh, like Dr. Jade Singleton. Uh, Jade, if I wanted uh, uh, to have a link in the blog of this podcast to your process, or at least to access to that process, where would they go? Well, definitely you can find me on LinkedIn. I'm always there hanging around. Um, and also you can check me out at the sarahjaneacademy.org uh, as well, where you know, you'll be able to see some of our materials there. This has been a great conversation, Jade. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. It's been a pleasure. Chat soon.